afternoon, and welcome to our TV show, featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host, Ergun Kurlukovalı, and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at www.mythsandrealities.com. These prominent Turks, accused of persecution of Armenians, were arrested and deported on the basis of hearsay and horror stories fabricated by the Armenians themselves without any preliminary investigation by the British authorities. The main source of information of the British High Commission in the capital city of Istanbul was a massive Armenian propaganda machinery conducted by the Armenian Patriarchate. From the very beginning, there was a great deal of doubt on the part of the French and even several British officials who were knowledgeable about the Turkish affairs as well as character. Admiral Webb, for instance, the acting British High Commissioner, wrote in March 1919, I quote, question of evidence in regard to the massacres will be extremely difficult, unquote. French authorities were against those arrests and deportations, which they characterized as political measures. Admiral de Robeck, the British High Commissioner in Istanbul, wrote in September 1919 that, I quote, it was impossible to rely on the allegations presented as facts by the accusing party, and that to sustain definite charges against these persons before the Allied Tribunal would be very difficult, unquote. In fact, none of those deportees were arrested based on any evidence, and no dossier in a legal sense ever existed to incriminate any of the detainees. From a political standpoint, it was highly desirable for the British government that at least some of these reportees should have been brought to trial. The British Foreign Office had left no stone unturned in order to prove that the so-called Armenian massacres actually took place in Turkey, and consequently, some of these detainees must have been proven guilty. Yet, all efforts and zeal in that regard ended with a complete failure. There was no evidence, no reliable witness, no proof, and no case. The only source that was counted on, the Armenian Patriarchate, furnished only rumors and hearsay fabricated and inflated by themselves. The Turkish capital was under Allied occupation and all the Ottoman state archives were easily accessible to the British authorities in Istanbul, and if there were any witnesses or any kind of evidence, they could have been found easily. The British High Commission was unable to forward to London any legal evidence. There was nothing in the British archives that corroborated the wild accusations of the Armenians. Nor did the American State Department archives have anything besides the wartime propaganda materials, which, if contested in a court of law, would have been proven ridiculous. Thus, the much propagandized and highly inflated so-called Armenian massacres proved to be a sheer fabrication even at the time they purportedly took place. Yet, some 60 years after the burial of those crude allegations, notwithstanding the resounding exoneration of the Turks, Armenians counted on people's short memories, have reinvented, revised, and embellished those stories, and launched a new public relations stunt. The only effective antidote against this scourge is to preach the gospel of truth. 
Here's the British government's position on the genocide allegations. The British government had condemned the massacres at the time. But in the absence of unequivocal evidence that the Ottoman administration took a specific decision to eliminate the Armenians under their control at that time, British governments have not recognized those events as indications of genocide. Nor do we believe it is the business of governments today to review events of over 80 years ago with a view to pronouncing them. Baroness Ramsey of Cartwell, Foreign Office Spokesperson, April 14, 1999. I quote, the government in line with previous British governments have judged the evidence not to be sufficiently unequivocal to persuade us that these events could be categorized as genocide, as defined by the 1948 UN Convention on Genocide, a convention which was drafted in response to the Holocaust and is not retrospective in application. The interpretation of events in Eastern Anatolia in 1915-1916 is still the subject of genuine debate among historians. Unquote. Baroness Scotland of Ostal, in a written response, February 7, 2001. The status of the Turkish detainees in Malta after the First World War is somewhat misunderstood and frequently misinterpreted. The initial point is that the Turks held in Malta were never actually acquitted since no court was ever convened and no charges were ever brought against them. There were accusations, certainly, but actual charges were never laid against the detained Turks since the quality of evidence available to, to the British was so poor. Armenians make much of the observation that geopolitical and imperial considerations blunted the vigor with which the British pursued the prosecution case against the detained Turks and claim that the Turks were simply traded for British prisoners held by the Turkish Republican forces. The former observation is inaccurate and the latter is oversimplification two usual tactics of Armenian lobbyists. The issue of commercial interests in Turkey, mainly that of oil, is also often cited as a crucial factor in the general failure of war crimes prosecutions. A simple look at the chronology of events might serve to clarify the problem. 1918, October 30th, Armistice between Turkey and Britain at Mudros. British Navy controls Turkish waters and Allied troops take possession of key positions. French General Despre enters Istanbul at the head of his troops, mounted on a white horse, emulating Fatih the Conqueror. 1918, November 1st. British forces occupied the city of Mosul. 1919, January 18th. Peace conference opens in Paris in 1919, March 16th. Allied military official officially occupies Istanbul, although they have actually been in place since November 1918. British troop numbers in the region initially exceeded 1 million men, but by this time were reduced to 350,000. Still a massive number. 1919, May 15, Greek forces land at Smyrna, 1928, uh, and uh, Ottoman courts martial process removed from Turkish custody and deported to Mudros at Malta. 68 Turks accused of war crime uh, atrocities to join others already detained. 1920, March 16, allies officially take military control of Istanbul. 1920, May 11th, Mustafa Kemal sentenced to death in absentia by Sultan's government. 1920, June 10th, Treaty of Serre presented to Ottoman government. 
1920, June 22nd, July 9th, Greek armies advanced into Anatolia and captured Bursa. 1921, July 10th, after initially being halted, Greeks continue offensive and capture Eskisher. 1921, August 23rd, September 3rd, 13th, Battle of Sakarya, Greek armies comprehensively de defeated by Ataturk. 1921, October 20th, Octo Treaty of Angora between Nationalist Government and France. 1922, August 26th, September 9th, Greeks mount counteroffensive but are beaten and Izmir falls to Nationalist forces. 1922, October 3rd, opening of Mudania Conference and agreement of armistice between allies and Turkish nationalists. November 20th, Lausanne Peace Conference opens. 1923, July 24th, Lausanne Peace Conference concludes with a treaty. 1923, October 2nd, allies evacuate Istanbul and nationalist forces take possession. 1926, June 5th, agreement on Mosul between Turkey, Britain, and Iraq. As one can see from the, this simplified chronology, the British and their values or various allies, French and the Greeks, were in complete control of events in Istanbul and in Western Anatolia for about two years and 11 months. From the de facto occupation of Istanbul until the Greek defeat at Sakarya. The British in particular, due to the pro-Greek and pro-Armenian and anti-Turkish leanings of Lloyd George, were pursuing a vigorous policy to dismember the Turkish homeland of Anatolia, while the French were striving to carve out their own share in Kilikia or Cilicia. The British were actively supporting the Greek invasion of Western Anatolia and were fully behind the dream of setting up a new Greek empire in Asia Minor because it fitted in with their imperial worldview at that time. The idea that the British were following a separate imperial agenda or were thinking of exchanging Turkish detainees for British prisoners held by the nationalists cannot be a serious proposition prior to the Battle of Sakarya. Up until the Greek defeat at Sakarya, the British were still betting on the Greek clients as the best means of pursuing their strategic objectives. It is true that the British were greatly concerned with what they perceived to have been neglect of or crimes against British POWs, but they were also very concerned with prosecuting Turks for crimes against Christians. Up until this point, the British, finding it impossible to find evidence against Turkish detainees that would stand up in court, were leaning more towards the concept of a collective punishment of all Turks that involved the dismemberment of the whole country, something that had been on the, on the books since 1915 anyway. The Allies, in spite of the fact that they had full access to Ottoman archives, were in control of Ottoman provinces to which Armenians were relocated and were in communication with the U.S. State Department, which should have had masses of evidence provided by the diligent work of Morgenthau and his various employees were unable to produce evidence that was viable in a British court. It was not until, the, until after the Greeks were defeated uh, in, in retreat and had been exposed as mass murderers themselves that the Anatolia policy of the British government became untenable and the prospect of prisoner exchanges became possible, indeed desirable. In fact, the behavior of Greek forces supported by Armenian and Greek irregulars was appalling and did considerable damage to the image of Greece in Britain and undermined British confidence in Greece's ability to administer 
the territory it aspired to. In short, British prosecutors had nearly three years to produce evidence that would stand up in court and were unable to do so. It was true that a legal technicality made it difficult to prosecute governments for actions taken against, against their own citizens, but Britain had gone some considerable way to circumventing this by devising the concept of a crime against humanity back in 1915, when the first accusations were made against the Ottoman government of crimes against Armenians. The legalistic framework should have been in place. British concerns over the oil fields of Iraq, especially Mosul, were irrelevant to the issue of British POWs and the Turks detained in Malta since they already had possession of the oil fields having held them since the capitulation of Turkish forces on October 30th, 1918. The Turkish nationalists had already accepted the loss of significant territories with the publication and ratification of the National Pact, Misaki Milli. The nationalists were less interested in the commercial potential of regions than they were in the idea of cultural or national integrity. One should not forget that the Mosul region was the only part of the National Fact Pact Atatürk was unable to secure. When the issue of Mosul was finally settled, the Turks accepted a one-off indemnity payment of, of 500,000 sterlings. It is hard to understand just how the issue of oil concessions could be any part of American strategic and economic thinking either, and much is made of the US willingness to press the Turks and support Armenian ambitions in this respect. It seems typical of much of the Armenian argument concerning the genocide and its consequences that factors relied upon are simply incorrect or irrelevant. This is one of the factors cited by George Horton in a book he published in 1926 with the pithy title of the blight of Asia. Mosul and the freedom, of freedom to give us a chance in the scramble for oil has been the subject of all negotiations at Lausanne. Peace and civilization may be talked about in public, but in private there is talk of oil. Because territories where the future concessionaries, concessionaires will be at pains to ensure their rights are at stake." Unquote. Now, this would have been perfectly true, but the Turks would not have been involved in this aspect of discussions other than as spectators since, as has already been pointed out, they did not hold any oil producing assets of significance. It's hard to believe that Horton would, would not have known this since, as the inside cover of the book states, he was for 30 years consul and consul general of the United States in the Near East. Of course, this book and many others like it is simply a polemic that is aimed at condemning Turks and promoting Christian values at the expense of facts. In the foreword of the book, the intent is made clear. I quote, high ideals are more than oil and railroads and the Turks should not be accepted into the society of decent nations until they show sincere repentance for their crimes." Unquote. The crimes of others against Muslims are simply never acknowledged. It is from polemics and propaganda tracts like this that the concessions for oil myth drives. That this approach continues is regrettable and undeniable. This book, along with others of the same ilk, have recently been republished by a company specializing in the republication of classic books under the editorship 
and there should be no surprises there, of an individual called Arasarafian. Armenians are correct in, po in pointing out that war crimes would have been the most opportune time to exterminate a troublesome minority. The question remains that if this was the aim, why didn't it happen? Why are there so many Armenian survivors when famine, disease, and elements and other warfare all conspired together to kill so many Muslims? 18% of the total Muslim population of Anatolia was dead by the end of the Turkish War of Independence, victims of nearly a decade of conflict. In regions where conflict with Armenians was worse, there too, Muslim mortality was worse. Van, 62%, Erzurum, 31%, Bitlis, 42%, Diyarbakir, 26%, Konya, 27%, Sivas, 15%, and so on. Independent estimates of Armenian mortality for Anatolia vary from 13 to 40%. It is hard to be precise since Armenians left the region and settled elsewhere. Muslims remained not having anywhere else to go. In any event, these figures are fully in accordance with losses among, amongst the Muslim populations, which should not be surprising since the same conditions were endured by all communities. The fact is that there's a curious concord concordance here in terms of casualties suffered, which should, for any reasonable person, be a cause for thought. British and American representatives in the East were clear observers of Armenian atrocities against Muslims and had remarkably little bitterness towards Turks who held them prisoner in spite of their tribulations because they, for the most part, understood the circumstances. The most vituperative anti-Turkish reports came from the armchair observers like Morgenthau, Lepsius, Sturmer, Horton, and so on, who had little to base their observations on other than carefully edited and selected reports and personal prejudice. It is observed that authors such as Sturmer provide considerable evidence of genocide, but this doubtful since the title of his book, Two War Years in Constantinople, gives the game away. He spent two years in Istanbul and did as much traveling and investigation as Morgenthau and Lepsius. None of them left Istanbul during the years of war. The assumption that as a German and ally, an ally of Turkey, Sturmer would be pro-Turkish is as erroneous as the suggestion that the British did not prosecute the Malta Turks because of the vestiges of 19th century pro-Ottoman sympathies. The simple facts are that once the war started, all bets are, were off and everything was up for grabs. The Germans being as keen as anyone to make profit from the Turks. The Germans were not particularly pro-Turkish and always had their own imperial economic and strategic interests in Asia Minor and the Caucasus as priority. The constant use of republished and clearly racist and biased sources in support of mythology has little relation to reality and is merely testament to the dishonest basis of the genocide proposition. If the Ottoman, British, and American archives could not produce any evidence to support the genocide claim a hundred years ago, what makes one think that they might produce some today? Will the information presented today finally help the Armenian diaspora see the plain truth? Will the Armenian diaspora finally accept the Turkish-American offer of civilized dialogue and reasoned discourse? Please join me next week to find out. Thank you and see you next week.